Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by the wonderful people at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. As I've been saying for the past few weeks, the ASA conference is fast approaching, decolonizing animals. It's going to happen in the middle of the year. It's going to be in New Zealand and it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I'll be there. You should be there too. Now, if for some very sad reason you're not able to join us in New Zealand for the Decolonising Animals Conference, then you should still engage with ASA anyway. You can follow them on Facebook and you can also become a member for just 50 Australian dollars. That's ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Okay, let's get down to the important business of the day. So the sun has, is about to set over the University of Sheffield, which means it's just slightly past lunchtime. <laughs> it's quite cold here as our winter descends, but we are going to warm our hearts with some very, very interesting thoughts. So this week, I'm very lucky to be joined by Dr. Sarah Bazan, this is when I work out, I don't Bazan. know. Bazan. <laughs> it's traditional for me to not to know how to say people's name. Now, Sarah is a Newton International Fellow at the University of Sheffield and she's very connected to the wonderful animal studies research group at Sheffield, which are called Shark. And today we're going to discuss her paper, Endling Taxidermy, Lonesome George, Global Genom- Genomics and oh, it's a very complicated, I, a very complicated paper. Can you tell yeah. us the title of your paper? It's Endling Taxidermy, Lonesome George, Global Genomics, and the Iconographies of Extinction. Right. <laughs> We're going to need your help, Sarah. And that paper will soon appear in the journal Configurations, a journal, journal of Literature, Science, and Technology. Welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Thanks for having me, Siobhan. Okay. Why this paper? Well, um, so there's a couple of different reasons why I wanted to write on endling taxidermy, but the most important thing that I should probably explain is that endling taxidermy is a contribution that's going to be inside of a special issue on taxidermic forms and fictions. And this is something that I'm co-editing with Susan McHugh, who is well known for literary animal scholars. Basically, what we found is that taxidermic themes in literature had really received very little sustained engagement. Um, in in animal studies more generally. And so we wanted to sort of bridge the gap between artistic and natural scientific um, taxidermic specimens with their literary counterparts. So let me just give you a brief sketch of what has gone on in animal studies to date on taxidermy. That's a good place to start. Please. So um, so to my estimation, there's about five different categories of of um, taxidermy forms that are analyzed in animal studies more generally. And these mostly come out of art historical circles and art historical approaches. So the first one is naturalist taxidermy. So this is the kind of stuff that you would see in the American Museum of Natural History. And it's the subject of Donna Haraway's essay, Teddy Bear Patriarchy. And she kind of analyzes sort of the the gorillas and the the taxidermy specimens by Akeley that appear in the American Museum of Natural History. She basically says that taxidermy in this kind of tradition, the naturalist tradition, is the servant of the real. So it's meant to look realistic. And then another option is reclaimed taxidermy. So Snybjörn's daughter and Wilson's installation project on polar bears um, is one example. And that's called Nanook, Flat Out and Bluesome, the Cultural Life of Polar Bears. And essentially that project is about reclaiming the lives and the animal biographies of certain animals. So they basically kind of research all of the different polar bear taxidermy specimens that exist in the UK and trace it all the way back to the beginning, figure out who it was that shot them, who it was that displayed them, and where were they displayed, who was the taxidermist, etc. So that's kind of one example of reclaimed taxidermy. Another example is um, Samuel Alberti's edited collection called Animal Afterlives. And in that edited collection, there's 
a number of examples like Maharaja, the elephant, or Balto, the husky, different essays that similarly kind of take the taxidermy form and trace it all the way back to the beginning and figure out what was the animal life that is lost here, what is it that is preserved, and what is it that is lost in these archives. Another example is botch taxidermy. I don't know if you've heard of botch taxidermy before. I have not. There's coffee table books dedicated to botch taxidermy, but essentially it's um, taxidermy that probably was more popular in the 19th century. So you can imagine a bunch of taxidermy specimens or specimens just generally picked up in the colonies and then brought back to the UK or the rest of Europe. And a taxidermist is sitting down to look at this animal that has actually never been seen by, them, by their own eyes. So they're, they're looking at, say, a lion, and they end up reconstructing this taxidermy mount of a lion, but they have no idea what a lion actually would have looked like. So it ends up being this like really poorly executed taxidermy specimen of a lion that looks nothing like a lion. And it's hilarious, you know, a century later. So that's one example. Another example is rogue taxidermy. And so that's um, a tradition established by the likes of Robert Marbury and Scott Bibbus. And these are, these are taxidermy artists that use kind of a pop surrealist aesthetic. And they create these very weird and unconventional sculptures. So one example is... Um, a taxidermy sculpture of like a zombified squirrel that is that's sort of biting into the bloodied human finger. It's this a taxidermy specimen that's meant to be very unconventional and kind of unsettle you as a viewer. And then the last category is speculative taxidermy, and this is the subject of Giovanni Alloy's most recent book of the same name. And basically, taxidermy art for Giovanni is is very much about seeing how taxidermy might be self-reflexive about its mediation of animal bodies. So one of the arguments that he makes in Speculative Taxidermy, his book, is that this kind of art develops its own tools for questioning our modes of perceiving, constructing, and consuming animals. So, so that's kind of the sketch of the field so far in terms of art historical approaches to taxidermy. But where do fictional representations of taxidermy fit in and what do they have to offer? That's kind of the leading question of the special issue. So um, I'll have to take you back to a moment that I had a couple of months ago, this little, little story that I had at the Leeds Discovery Center, which is this kind of weird storeroom here in the UK. And it's, there's probably a number of them like them all over the world. But imagine a storeroom with just like a, a kind of a hodgepodge of stuff, like rows and rows of botanical specimens in drawers or racks of, you know, 19th century dressing gowns, just kind of a weird assembly of things. And inside of this storeroom was a number of really interesting taxidermy specimens. So there was a bisected chimpanzee, for example. There was a nursery room rocking horse, which actually had, like, it was made of real horse hide, so it actually had, like, a real mane and tail and everything else. There was a whole assembly line of Nile River crocodile handbags and a matching assembly of Nile River crocodile taxidermy amounts. And these had been confiscated from, by the UK border agents. So this like whole assembly of just like really weird things all kind of put together. But what really sort of stopped me in my tracks was this archive of extinct taxidermy specimens that existed in this storeroom. So the, the museum guide that I was with, she stretched on a pair of these purple medical grade latex gloves and she spun open this mobile shelving unit to reveal these amazing um, taxidermy specimens of extinct species. So one of them was the great auk, which is um, a flightless bird that went extinct in the mid 19th century. And it was kind of sitting right alongside um, a really sun bleached diorama of a thylacine, which you might know being from sure Australia. Day. It was um, sort of an, a carnivorous marsupial from Tasmania that went extinct in the 1930s. So it was really amazing to see these these really rare and precious specimens sitting there on, on the shelf. And the, the specimen of the great auk in particular really reminded me a lot of this story by H.G. Wells. And the reason it reminded me of it is because the, the great auk had been, I guess, retired because its right eye had fallen out. So it's looking really derelict. It really, in terms of naturalist taxidermy, the kind that I was talking about before, it really didn't, it wasn't serving as being a servant of the real. It really wasn't representative of what a great auk would have looked like. It was actually made of razor bill um, skin and, f and, and like feathers and stuff. So it really wasn't even made of most of what a great auk would be made of. So H.G. Wells, um, he talks about the secret of taxidermy in his, in his short story. 
And so you have to kind of imagine this, the scene is set in this short story with like a taxidermist who is sitting in his chair and he's, he's somewhere between his first and his fourth glass of whiskey. And he's talking about what the secret of taxidermy is all about. Um, and he essentially starts talking about how the secret of taxidermy is that it's all about forgery and fraudulence. So the great auk in H.G. Wells' story is actually something that is made of grebs feathers and the great auk eggs are actually made of porcelain. So, so yeah, the, the short story kind of shows us that taxidermy is all about fraudulence and duplicity. And that's something that, that Susan McHugh and I are arguing in the special issue is that taxidermic fictions are very much about this fraudulence and duplicity. So in art historical circles, taxidermy seems to be very much about this play on authenticity and the real, the realism of it. But we argue that there's this kind of hiddenness that's already built into taxidermic forms. Um, and really, I mean, the meaning of animal hide is, you know, just to hide or to secret, to conceal, to hide away somewhere. So in literary taxidermy, there's no actual animal, um, but rather it's a representation of a representation. So taxidermy itself is a representation. So literary taxidermy kind of adds on to that doubledness, that doubled quality. So there's this doubledness, as I say, there's a fraudulence, a hiddenness, kind of a secret that is built into taxidermic fictions. So, for example, if, if Alloy argues that speculative taxidermy is speculative because it is self-reflexive, because it has sort of this like self-awareness of the mediation of animal bodies, then taxidermic fictions is just doubly so. Um, it's, it's a kind of it's a kind of way of thinking about how taxidermic fictions might offer an amplified scope of analysis that really helps us understand how and why animal bodies are being mediated in this way. Um, and the other thing that we say is that in this scope of analysis, it's also kind of becoming very sticky. Taxidermic fictions are sticky because they start kind of picking up all the other histories that are that they're embedded in. So colonial history, stories of gendered and sexual violence, racial injustice, um, other issues like extinction and genocide, for example. So, so these kinds of, of taxidermic fictions can offer us a lot. And my essay on Endling Taxidermy really responds specifically to extinction, and particularly its visibilities and invisibilities, what it is that we can see on, and not see at this particular moment when we have so many species disappearing around us all the time. So, um, so essentially what I did was I, I ended up going to the Galapagos Islands this past summer and I visited the Charles Darwin Research Station and I was I was really interested in the endling taxidermy of Lonesome George. Have you heard of Lonesome George before? I've not, Sarah. No? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's but okay. please educate me. Yeah, I will. Um, so Lonesome George, he was the last Pinta Island tortoise. So he went extinct on June 24th, 2012. Um, and it was really, it created this huge eruption of sadness um, in, in his native Ecuador and, and really worldwide. Um, but the, the display that you can actually see at the Charles Darwin Research Station on Santa Cruz Island in the Galapagos, I think is a little bit disappointing in some ways. It, it kind of erases the history of the species. And it really, I think my critique in the essay is that it kind of fails to to fully sketch out why the species went extinct and how the human figures into all of that. And there's a few narrative threads that go along with it. And so the very first thing that I say in the, in the opening of the, of, the, of the essay is um, it kind of begins with, with Kurt Vonnegut's novel Galapagos. And so this is like another opportunity for me to connect taxidermic fictions with taxidermic forms. But essentially Vonnegut's novel is all about a bunch of humans who are going extinct, <laughs> essentially. So it's, a, it's kind of a way of thinking about a group of humans that are becoming endlings, the last of their species. And have you heard of the, of the term endling before? Do no. you know what, Sarah? <laughs> I am so ignorant and naive in relation to everything. No, I've not heard that term, but mm -hmm. I think it's a great term and I'm very, very pleased for you to, um, you know, help bring it into my vocabulary. Well, that's the whole point of the essay is to kind of bring more visibility to the, cat the category of endling taxidermy. And to be quite honest with you, I had never heard of endling before like July, like literally when I was writing this essay. Oh, um, that makes me feel yes. better. <laughs> um, so yeah, an endling is essentially the last individual of a species. And so what I was interested in is how um, species extinction is made visible or invisible through the endling, how this figure that is being preserved and represented and posed for posterity. But what I learned about this, um, it's actually a really fascinating story, the whole history of the Pinta Island tortoise and how it came to be extinct. 
Um, and so you have to kind of start, I'm not really sure where to start actually, because you could start with like the line of originals that came over from South America, sort of the original tortoises that made their way over to the Galapagos Islands when they were newly formed vol- volcanic islands. But um, for, the, for the sake of like the scale and scope of the essay, I started it with, with uh, the visit of the Beagle in 1835 with Charles Darwin. And even at that time, you can, sort of, you can sort of see in Darwin's writing that he's beginning to become a bit more aware of the fact that extinction is happening on the planet, or like right around him, and particularly in the Galapagos Islands. Um, and so what ends up happening is Darwin brings home this, this tortoise from the Galapagos that he ends up naming James. And it was sort of a, a mystery for a little while because he went missing, and no one really know where he w- knew where he went. Um, based on letters and manuscripts, they knew that Darwin had this tortoise from the Galapagos, Um, And they knew that he had died and been taxidermied, but no one knew where he went. But um, a few years ago, he was found in the London Museum of Natural History. So this is kind of like a bit of history that's really interesting, right? Um, And this is sort of like like a whole bunch of history in terms of the way that tortoise taxidermy has exploded ever since the 19th century. And you have to kind of think about the reasons why that is. I think it's partly because tortoises were going extinct all over the place. And so taxidermy was a way to, to preserve them and, and make sure that we had them in museums so that we could still study their species and kind of hold a record of what this what this species was all about. There's a, a really interesting book that was published about 40 years after the Beagle's visit. Um, and it kind of holds a record of all the different gigantic land tortoises. It was by Albert Gunther, and he wrote it in 1877. So that has like a bunch of different examples of different kinds of taxidermy that h- were held at different museums at the time. Um, but things really changed radically in 1905, 1906 with the, the California Academy of Sciences expedition to, to the, the Galapagos. So basically what happened is there was this awareness that like tortoises were going extinct all over the place. We have to get to the Galapagos. We have to, we have to like preserve them. But they had a really kind of ambitious and sort of aggressive conservation program where they basically, like, any time they found anything, they killed it. And they put it on the boat. And they brought it back to San Francisco. And it was it was sort of, you know, fortuitous in a way when they got back because right around that time was, like, the, the San, Francisco, San Francisco earthquake. So if they had brought it back a few days before they actually did, um, all of those specimens, those 70,000 biological specimens that were back on the, on the ship would have been lost. So just as it happens, there's these three Pinta Island tortoises that were, you know, caught, butchered, and taxidermied by the crew um, of the California Academy of Sciences. So the really fascinating part of this whole story, and I'm sorry, this is a long, like, No, it's <laughs> fascinating. Please keep um, going. Yeah, the, so basically what happened is that these three Pinta Island tortoises that were found, butchered, and preserved by the California Academy of Sciences were the last three other known relatives of Owens and George. So it's kind of amazing to me that this has happened. You have these three, these three specimens that are now sitting in the California Academy of Sciences. Um, and they're, they're now a repository for DNA sort of genetic analysis and genomic analysis. So the next part of the story is that Gisela Cacone, who is a Yale University researcher, um, she started kind of working with these three specimens that were at the California Academy of Sciences and trying to like build a history of the group um, and sort of like figure figure out how Lonesome George fits into it. They wanted to find out specifically if he really was a Pinta Island tortoise or if he had been like a stowaway on some other um, boat that had gone in and out of one of the other islands. But they did find out that he is, you know, he was a Pinta Island tortoise and that he was directly related to these three other tortoises. But the question for me was like, what does an endling mean? Because those three those three tortoises that were preserved in the Academy of Sciences, um, they were all male. So essentially you've already, the, the line was extinct. It was functionally extinct right. at that point. And so the way that we sort of, um, at least in conservation biology, but also just in the public imagination, the way that we think about extinction really needs to be, we need to be precise about how we think about it. Um, and so my goal in writing this, this essay was to think about how um, this whole story of taxidermy and, t- and tortoise taxidermy specifically from extinction all the way to de-extinction or the revival of the species, which is something that's, that, might be, that might happen eventually, um, is to think about book history and the way that the book of life is configured. So one of the things I do in the essays is talk about the, the term origination, which is this term that comes from book history. And it basically just means the way that a book is assembled. And that's kind of the way I'm thinking about how taxidermy functions in the book of life. It's about the assembly 
of these taxidermy tortoises. And taxidermy itself just kind of means the arrangement of skin. And if origination more or less means the arrangement and order of a book, then you have these like very similar sets of terminology. Um, and so they kind of work really well together. But the thing that I found really fascinating about the endling, and actually really sad about the endling, is that it's always alone. And so you might want to think about this in relation to um, an analysis of the firsts and the lasts. So you have Dolly, who is like the clone sheep, the, the global icon of genetic engineering. And she is sort of always by herself, if you look at a lot of these images of her. But one thing that Susan McHugh points out in one of her articles is that there's been like a whole succession, a whole line of failed and deformed and, you know, executed like failures of, of the clone um, that existed before Dolly. And those never really enter into the visual record. And so how does sort of how does the endling function in relation to Dolly the clone? Well, if you go to um, the Edinburgh Museum, you see Dolly, who she's sort of taxidermied now, and she's on this rotating podium, and she's kind of like spinning around, and she's got a bit of grass strewn on around the bottom, but she's by herself. And so the argument that I'm making is that, similar to Lonesome George, who is displayed all by himself in the Hall of Hope yeah, at the Charles Darwin Research Station, similarly, Dolly the sheep is, is also by herself. And so the problem with that is that reality and the way that we think about mass extinction and about the reproduction of, of extinct species or just any species in general is that they're fashioned around their metonymic status. And a metonym really is just like a, a stand-in for the whole. So if Dolly is the stand-in for the whole of genomic um, experimentation, then similarly Lonesome George is the stand-in for the rest of his species. But that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on a single individual animal to represent the whole of their species. So my argument in this essay is to say that their iconic bodies are standing in for the whole of past, present, and future species lines, and that they're basically crushed under the weight of their own metonymic function. It's, it's too much. So essentially, I mean, this whole story shows us that you know, there's a way in which that we're seeing sp species extinction through the lens of the endling and the endling taxidermy. And what does the endling taxidermy specimen allow us to see or not see about this? Wow, fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was just amazing. So, uh, thinking about taxidermy more generally, have you had time to pause and think about what it might say about the human-non-human -human relationship? Well, I think it certainly shows that we have a desire to capture and display animals. But, I mean, it's really particular about, you know, there's, there's narratives built into the way that we, we build in, in taxidermy because taxidermy is a kind of narrative art in and of itself. You are reconstructing an animal through its body to tell a story about its, its, its relationship to its environment or its relationship to other individuals um, in its own family or its own species lines. It's telling, it's telling a lot, actually, about our human-animal relationships. And for the most part, I would say that, that and I think maybe this, this particular claim is, is one that would align with Giovanni Alloy's in speculative taxidermy, but I would say like the, the vast majority of, majority of taxidermy really is about the carnal desire for you know, representing the taxidermy animal in the way that we want, the way that we want to see it. Um, and it's not a lot about actually capturing and respecting the life of that lived, that individual animal. Um, and Jane Desmond actually writes a lot about this too, that, you know, there's sort of a uniqueness and authenticity that's associated with naturalist um, taxidermy in particular, because the, the, the taxidermy specimen is supposed to stand in for its exemplary, you know, uniqueness. So, you know, that deer, but it also stands in for the whole of its species, like deer more generally. So I think it shows that we, we attempt to mediate animal bodies so that we can tell a narrative about our relationship to, the, to animals and their environment. Mm. I know somebody who uh, has a fondness for taking photos of what she considers to be weird-looking taxidermied animals and posting them online. I always found it very offensive. I didn't, it did nothing for me. I didn't find it funny or interesting. I, I found it very disrespectful. But I don't know, am I reading it in the wrong way or is that perhaps... I mean, I think perhaps she's more making fun of the person who did the taxidermied work. But 
I think within it we are all, I guess, disrespecting animals on some level in that context. Is that fair? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think the the purveyors and like the actual taxidermists out there, like a lot of them would argue that they're they're offering some dignity to this animal by by remediating their body as being perpetually alive. And I know that you could think about that for hunting trophies or for pets that expire and you take them to the taxidermist and now you have like your dog sitting with you at your at your fireplace or at your feet for the rest of your life. I I sim I kind of align more with you and I I knew that you know 5 or 6 years ago when I started kind of reading about taxidermy I was trying to figure out what my fascination with it was and also my my feelings of uncertainty and like feeling really unsettled about it. I thought why are we why are we doing this? This is really weird. And I had a, an aha moment when I was looking at the taxidermy. It's like vintage recycled taxidermy by Angela Singer, who I think is, I think she might be in Australia. Yeah, I think she might be a Kiwi actually. Or she might be Australian. I'm, yeah, I'm maybe. not sure. Yeah, maybe you're right. Um, but anyway, I, I think I had an aha moment just looking at her stuff because I realized that when she was doing these sort of vintage recycled taxidermy forms, Basically, she was kind of adding jewels and, and other kinds of like brooches and things that would that were really highly ornamental. And that for me was an example, although I couldn't arti- articulate it at the time. But with the with the, the publication of Giovanni Alloway's book, Speculative Taxidermy, it helps me understand that that vintage recycled taxidermy was being speculative. It was developing its own tools for helping us understand the way in which we're consuming and representing animals. So it was, you know, self it's self-reflexive about its own mediation and its own representation. And the moment that it does that, it, then we're no longer looking at an animal for our, our pleasure, but we're looking at the way that we represent animals. And we're, we're forced to think about what that means and the problems with it, the problems mm. that come along with it. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. Well, Sarah, I ask everyone who comes on Knowing Animals to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I think so. <laughs> Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Well, we were talking about this a few days ago because I asked you what does pro-animal mean. Um, And I'm not sure exactly if the very first piece of animal studies work that I read was actually pro-animal, but it was Jacques Derrida's The Animal That Therefore I Am, which is, I'm sure, um, a piece that a lot of animal studies um, scholars end up reading when they they first get started. Um, And I think for him... In some ways, I don't know that he's really actually all that interested in animals in a way. Like, he's really more interested in thinking about the human and language. But for me, that was the first time I started thinking about what being human might be and what might mean to be a human animal. Mm. Wonderful. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Yes. So, um, if you can probably tell already, I'm fascinated by dead, dying, decomposing animals in literature and film. Um, And so... The very first piece of pro-animal scholarship I wrote was an article that I published in the Journal for for Critical Animal Studies in 2011. Um, And it sort of was my attempt to sketch out an animal thanatology. Um, And the reason I was interested in that was because I sort of felt like there was a way in which the life-death distinction and the human-animal divide were intersecting in really interesting ways. So the article ended up being kind of um, a rumination on that problem. Mm, Fantastic. If you had to name one animal study scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? It's really hard to narrow that down, but um, you know how sometimes you read a book in your life and it just kind of comes along at the very right moment and you're just irredeemably changed forever? <laughs> um, for me, that book was Nicole Shukin's Animal Capital. I absolutely love that book. Um, I think it was just the thing that I needed to read at that particular moment in my academic journey. And I still really admire it for its academic rigor and for its sort of long-standing contribution to the field. Wonderful. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Well, I think as a researcher and a teacher, the times when I've been teaching classes, it's really been about challenging the narrative of human exceptionalism. Um, And I think the more that we talk about animals and the more we disseminate our research outside of the ivory tower of the academy, the better our lives are going to be and the better the lives of animals are going to be too. Wonderful. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human animal relationship, what would it be? Um, So this is my weird contribution that I was making in my my dissertation, which I defended last year. And that's in in terms of thinking about how we change the human-animal relationship 
in terms of death and decomposition. And so one, the one way I'd really like to change the relationship between human, the human and animal relationship is to think about the funeral industry a little bit differently. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about natural burial initiatives. So you have uh, Coeho, which is like the natural burial initiative around a mushroom burial shroud. So it kind of like has these little mushroom spores built into the shroud and it kind of helps the body to decay and de decompose um, and allow it to be a part of its environment. And there's a bunch of other examples. There's um, Katrina Spade's urban compost renewal system. Um, and there's, there's also the tree burial pod initiative. I think that came out of Italy. So there's all these different natural burial initiatives that I think reimagine a relationship between the human and the animal in a really productive way. Um, and I think that I think the reason that's productive is because it kind of unravels this idea that the human is 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 exceptional and that we are somehow that we should be put into a coffin and, you know, sort of like hermetically sealed from the rest of the world once we die. That's that seems really silly to me. And so I think of death and decomposition as kind of a creative threshold that maybe when we die, we can make a contribution to our environments and to the animals around us and let them eat us. I know that's really weird, but that's my that's my thought. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I think that relates to why I found this person posting all these taxidermy pictures so offensive. I mean, presumably what you don't want is for us to get you taxidermied and then sit you around the house for the rest yeah, of exactly. our lives. No, that's weird. <laughs> um, how can people find out more about your work? Oh, yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at Sarah Bazan and you can also go to my website for a list of publications and that's just sarahbazan.com. Wonderful. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. You can follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or you can follow me at SO underscore S. We also have a Facebook page, an Instagram account and importantly, reviews at iTunes are very much appreciated. They make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.